Chapter 2 The Wondrous Universe There were days when little was said, and there were other days when our conversations were like a salad bar, providing a rich assortment of variety, with the only consistency being the input of his greater wisdom. In the beginning, it was mostly that way. As time passed, he infused my consciousness with a broader viewpoint, capable of assimilating larger patterns of thought and meaning. The growth of my consciousness might be compared to a teenager enrolled in ballroom dancing. An instructor's first task might be to get the student's two left feet untangled, synchronized with the music, and off his own toes. At first, it was hard enough to keep from tripping myself, although he adroitly kept his own balance. Then one day, by a touch of grace, I began waltzing to the music. That acceleration of harmony was expedited most dramatically one morning when he observed me assembling pieces of understanding like a jigsaw puzzle. Offering to help me make sense of it, he suggested that I reach for my drawing pad and felt tip marker. You're trying to erect a building out of bricks and mortar without a plan. Let me provide you with some key factors which you're groping to find. On the large white sheet of paper, he had me draw an equilateral triangle with the base at the bottom so that it rested stably with its apex pointing upward. He described the components of the universe as being basically three. The first is love, the second is spirit, and the third is a substance which is finer than anything that has yet been isolated by science. It is finer than the atom or any of its component parts. As the ultimate simple particle, it is the irreducible building block of the universe. Comprehending this particle is currently a major objective in physics research. It is variously called by several names, including the Higgs boson, and some have even called it the God particle. There is, however, an ironic truth in that sarcasm. This particle is prior to the existing family tree of particles, which accounts for its difficulty in being studied. Apparently, it creates mass, whereas other particles are the result of mass. There is a particle substance, which is the matrix of all energy mass. Its particle units are utterly generic in nature and are the basic, irreducible components of physical existence. He called them adamantine particles. At the top of the triangle, he placed love. The source of love is the Father, the Creator Himself, who is to all of existence like the sun is to life on earth. Yet, the light of his love is so brilliant, only its halo can be perceived. The source of pure love is the ultimate source of all love. From that love, you are emanated or created. Like a ray of light, you are an entity of his love. Love is the name of God, and love is your name as well. In that, you were created in his likeness. You are known and shall always be known by the nature of your love. Beyond the recognition of love, the presence and nature of God can simply not be described. For holy presence is the definer, not the defined. No sooner had he said that than he anticipated my next question by adding, the Holy Trinity is also a sacred mystery which precedes and determines the tripart universe. <clears throat> like God, it cannot be defined, but is manifested everywhere in the very presence of all that exists. In the dimension of knowable reality, you might say that the One Spirit is holy whenever it manifests in the presence of God and the adamantine particles are literally the body of God whenever they bring form to his will. Whenever he would direct his attention to the Father, his eyes would well. 
Perhaps it was partly because he was looking into a blinding light. However, the love and reverence he felt for the holy source was more than even he could express in words. The emotions which poured from him were message enough. The name of your father is love, and so too is that your immortal name. Love is the essence of true beingness. Love is not something that you do or don't do, give or don't give, receive or don't receive. In other words, it is not a commodity, not a derivative substance. Love is not something which is subject to the laws of abundance or scarcity. Love is who you are. For that reason, love is ultimately unconditional because it is not subject to any of the conditions of existence. I am glad to hear people talking more about unconditional love today, but they need to understand more fully how and why it is that way. Love is unconditional because it is our origin and who you are, not something that is done unconditionally. Actions are always conditional to some degree because relationships have conditions, because existence has conditions. And if love were something you do, there would be no escaping that fact. There was a sense of relief. As I settled down in my chair, I wanted to understand and practice unconditional love, but I had not wanted to be an unconditional doormat. The true nature of love is the answer to the riddle. The greatest mystery of the universe is that love is the sacred aspect of beingness. Be it to the fullest, and the rest of your life will fall into place. The second great element of existence is spirit. All things are of spirit. Pointing to the left corner of the triangle, he instructed me to write spirit. There is but one spirit. Spirit is in all things, around all things, with all things, and of all things. There is no such thing as spirit being isolated to a pure zone apart from manifest creation. He cautioned that there have been many theories of matter versus spirit such theories reflect an absence of real understanding and an obsession with the dualities of structured thinking. Inseparable and indivisible spirit is in all things. There is no place where spirit is not. Spirit is one. Spirit must be understood as whole, continuous, and unbroken. Whenever a person views spirit as the opposite of matter, he has entered the world of misconception and duality. It is not true that earth is material and heaven is of the spirit. Spirit is the unity of us all and of heaven and earth. It is through the oneness of spirit that the miracle of prayer can work. It is through the oneness of spirit that the power of dreams, of visions, and of prophecies can work. In the spirit, we are one. Therefore, in spirit, we live one life, unified in a state of brotherhood, in a state of common awareness and seeking, either enlightenment and uplifting, or darkness and downpulling, whichever way one chooses it to be. Regardless of how your experience unfolds, we are of one spirit, and your experience is shared by all. As a matter of fact, the greatest breakthrough of modern physics, the one that every other discovery hinges on, was the discovery of the unified field. Every development in modern physics would have been impossible had that breakthrough in consciousness not occurred. Scientists just have not realized yet that what was discovered is the physical presence of spirit. He explained that our science is on the threshold of its next 
greatest leap, which will provide a basis for discovering the adamantine particles. The third corner on the triangle represents the element of particularized reality, through which differences of potential and separate configurations are made possible. This third element manifests as particles. Sometimes he referred to them as particles of infinity, but usually he called them adamantine particles. The first time I heard the word adamantine, it had an unfamiliar ring to my ears. I just assumed that it was a word unique to him, or perhaps to heaven, or to some other dimension of reality of which I was not aware. So I just accepted it as an exotic word. Later on, when he used the term adamantine particles interchangeably with particles of infinity, I asked for some clarification. Explaining his choice of words, he indicated that adamantine comes from the root word adamant, which means unsubmitting, impenetrable, unyielding. This is a particle so small that it is irreducible, non-negotiable, fundamental, and utterly elemental. It is from this particle that all complex forms are built. This describes the character of the particle, and the term particle of infinity refers to its function, for it is basic to all physical existence without dimensional limitation. This is the particle that the ancient Greek philosophers postulated when they first named the atom. Of course, what science calls an atom today is a very complex particle, and not at all what the Greeks envisioned. With his usual affirmative tone, Jesus encouraged me to consider that the search for smaller and smaller particles has been a necessary process for peeling the onion of our scientific understanding. He assured me that the ultimate particle of discovery is on the horizon and that it will unlock a door to many current mysteries about the way things work. Returning to the diagram, he said, look at the triangle again and take note of its arrangement. Love is at the top. Then spirit resonates to love and love commands the adamantine particles. From this, all creation has occurred. Before I could proceed with that lesson, however, I had to clarify an issue that was now bothering me. In this world, we talk about each other's spirit as an aspect of individuality. You know, your spirit, my spirit, Brian's spirit, my cat's spirit, and so forth. Are there separate parts within the one? With tranquil firmness, he assured me, there is just one spirit. Well, I persisted, I always know when you enter the room because your spirit feels different. No, it is my love that feels different. We are each known by our love. Spirit resonates to our love. It's just like a lake with many fish, where every fish sets off a different vibration within the water. So too, your love resonates with the spirit differently than anyone else's, like a fingerprint. You may say, this is what another spirit feels like, but actually, this is how the spirit, the one and only spirit, resonates to him. If you want the one and only spirit to resonate with you more affirmatively and distinctly, then truly be the love that you are. What you have learned to recognize, Glenda, is my love. My love feels like no one else's. Brian's love feels like no one else's. And so it is. 
Each person's love feels like no one else's, so the spirit responds and honors each one's love as a unique imprint, and that love, in turn, commands the adamantine particles. It is love which defines your individuality, not spirit. Spirit is the indivisible element, and adamantine particles are the building blocks for complex existence. They are utterly generic in nature. Only love has the capacity for singularity and individuality. Without love, you would be as indistinguishable as a grain of sand on the shore. Building upon this introduction to love, one day he asked, Glenda, would you like to know the best way to discover and to prove that you are love and that love is not an external commodity? Sure, I rushed to reply. Love your enemies. It wasn't the answer I had hoped for, and I was not exactly comfortable with the recommendation, although I was all ears to hear more. When you are in the presence of your enemies, you know for a fact that any love you are able to feel is not because of external factors. You are not loving your adversary because of his kindness, or because you like the color of his eyes, or because you stand to profit by the encounter. In the presence of your enemies, you know that you are love and the source of your love. That is the most important reason I told you to love your enemies, not for you to become weak or passive, not for you to be walked on, not for you to suffer, not for you to yield advantages to those who oppose you, but for you to learn that you are love, and knowing this, you gain command. External conditions do not have the ability to teach you who you are. However, as long as you believe that they can, you will always be seeking permission from the external world to exist. That obsession is your real enemy. Directing my attention back to the chart, he reiterated, love commands the adamantine particles. Between you and anyone opposing you, there are many shared particles. Now, of the two of you, which one is going to command them? The one who loves. That's the first point, but there's more. Such experiences will give you an opportunity to learn the most important thing you can ever know about yourself as well as the subject of love. The world would have you think that love is the consummating emotion of desired and pleasurable effects. In other words, that love is created. Nothing could be further from the truth, for love is the universal instrument of cause and command. Last, but certainly not least, you might just find out that the person in opposition to you was not really your enemy. And let's not limit this to human opponents. Let's talk about a storm that is approaching. How could you turn a storm around? I never thought that I could, I said, sitting there in amazement to think he would ask me such a question. You would look for the motivating force of the storm and then be the love in its presence. You can command the storm, for the adamantine particles are commanded by love. Love is the source of everything. It is the commander and that command has been delegated to you as a child of love. This is why, in any situation, you can win by the power of love, not by doing love. This is where you trip up. You have to be love, love that is a burning fire at the heart of any situation. You can literally quell the storm by loving the forces that comprise it. After a quiet moment, he continued, Behold the beauty of the storm. Behold the beauty of the forces that make it up. Love it to its very core. 
Find the necessity of it until you are one with it. Several things could happen, depending upon your degree of assurance. The storm could just dissipate into thin air, or possibly it would turn into gentle rain. Maybe it would be redirected to another place, or at the very least it would bring no harm to you, for love does not hurt love. If you want to get varmints out of your house, love them into another position. Many people already know this and don't use chemicals. They just love the bugs elsewhere. I can't begin to tell you how many changes you can make in your life by using love to command the adamantine particles. In all the days I spent with Jesus, I do not recall his using the word control as a part of his instructions of life. Several times, however, he made reference to the tragic state of people locked into obsessions for control. He said, Control is a ploy for achieving dominance within a dualistic situation. When people are operating within polarities, control is what they use to reinforce their preferred position. What makes it even worse is that after control is established, the polarities will be maintained in order to perpetuate the control. By contrast, command was a very positive topic for him. He seemed to imply by tone and gesture that it is a part of our covenant and that exercising command is central to our dignity. The sole authority of it is love being love. All the particles you have ever commanded with love are yours to have forever. That was a mind-boggling thought, far too great to take in all at once, but I composed myself enough to inquire, is that how you resurrected your body? Of course, it was the love that gave me total command of all the particles that had ever composed my body, and they were reconstructed by the laws of love, by the laws instead of by the laws of structure. Thereby, I was a prisoner of structure no more. Then he mentioned the new earth with the new bodies we will have, which will be under the conscious direction of love. He did not say when, but he assured me that the transformation will be brought about by knowing the truth of what love is. In this new state of existence, love will literally cause the pulse beat of your heart and the cells of your body. Love will propel the blood through your veins. Love will spark your thoughts and all the energies around you and all that you magnetize to yourself. Is that how you multiplied the fishes? Well, yes, he modestly admitted. You really did multiply the fishes, didn't you? It wasn't just a metaphor, was it? No, it wasn't a metaphor. I really did multiply the fishes. You know, all I had to do was love one fish enough. How simple he made it sound. All I could do was look at him in wonder and whisper, that must have been some kind of love. His understanding of everything was whole. He bore no witness of duality or opposition, and there was no stress anywhere in his presence. He had profound respect for technology when it was based upon truth and understanding and when it was used to implement a democratized consciousness of reality. He seemed to have a great respect for science, for scientific thinking, and for higher pursuits of competence. However, he did not favor support for artificially created structures of the mind. He wanted to see our understanding based upon simple truths of existence and applied to support our actual needs. There was a sense of disregard for excess technology which exists only to create monopolies of power to leverage the compliance of people 
or to create dependencies on artificial environments and situations. Aside from that, he had a tremendous reverence for workability because he knew it drew its power from the laws of God. Workability is the harmony of God manifest upon the earth, he proclaimed. Too often we regard the tenets of structure as the cause of orderliness and workability in life. This is a grand illusion on which structure has momentarily secured a franchise. He frequently reminded me of our right as loving beings to innocently perceive all that is. Then we can make it work by commanding the love which joins us to it. Your mind prefers to structure your involvement with reality and to justify that obsession. It wants to pre-guess and predetermine what life represents. The structural models which the mind projects then become the great trap. Such formulas condition your perceptions to honor their designs as sacred and even more basic than innocent reality. That is the lie. In no uncertain terms, he made it clear that intelligence is not limited to the mind. Mind is the meeting ground of structure and intelligence. If your intelligence were limited to the barriers and mortality of structure, then your potential to have a transcendent comprehension of the universe would be hopelessly impossible. Innocent perception is the great revealer. He would encourage me to sit quietly and perceive, to look out a window, and just say what is. You don't need a formula or a formal education to approach life. Sometimes I would talk about the painting in relation to structural composition, and he would help me see the process more directly, to see more innocently just what was there in front of me. Any time I would start to make a mental formula out of it, he would redirect the flow, saying, Glenda, you don't need this. You don't need these mental formulas through which to view life or to explain what you're doing. Just be here and perceive. Relax and just be. His constant encouragement was to just be. Once, when we were talking about innocent perception, it triggered an old question I had from the book of Genesis. It was about a man's expulsion from the Garden of Innocence because of our ancestors' inquiry into the subject of good and evil. I wanted to know why man was forbidden to study good and evil. Because study is a pursuit of the mind, and the mind is endlessly polarized. Therefore, when the mind pursues the subject of good and evil, there is no escaping duality. It will only use its perceptions to judge and to condemn. Then he added, The heart already knows the path to right living. The heart does not need to study a subject which is native to it. The mind, however, can never know true goodness. The real basis for goodness is love, then honoring life through innocent perception and compassionate service according to one's purpose. You cannot intellectually comprehend the subject of good and evil. It falls into place only when you are being the love that you are. No amount of good deeds can compensate for an inadequacy of love. It is love which the spirit cherishes, and the spirit will not be cheated from that love. Love is above ethics and always will be. Otherwise, how could there be grace? True ethics are shaped out of the patterns of love. When we try to mentally comprehend the subject of right and wrong, apparently all we do is fall into judgment, condemnation, barriers, and the exiling of those with whom we don't agree. Conscience is native to your heart. What you call guilt is a built-in alarm system which signals your departures from the heart. A man who follows his heart will never feel guilt, even if he steps a little outside the bounds of what society deems proper. But, on the other hand, 
A man who lives only in his mind will bear a secret guilt, even if he tries logically to do the right thing. There will be no inner satisfaction in it, and so he will soon lose his ability to know what the right thing is. Eventually, he will cease trying, leaving hidden guilt which embeds as a recurring distress. He may spend fortunes on therapy or alcohol to anesthetize or remove it, but the eventual result is that a mind-dominated person will destroy his immune system. This is the end product of a mind-dominated world, but you can reverse it very simply with total grace. How? Follow your heart. I chuckled with the thought that rolled into my consciousness. The mind follows the bucks, doesn't it? Unfortunately, that's true. One thought led quickly to another, and then I was face to face with my next question. In the New Testament, Paul teaches, the love of money is the root of all evil. Did you say that? Close but those were not my exact words. As Aramaic was transposed to Greek, some of the practical simplicity of my message was absorbed into the more abstract nature of Greek thinking. Aramaic was a people's language, not a scholar's language. That's why I chose it. In addition to that, Paul had his own way of carrying the message of love according to the needs and understanding of those he served. Greed is the root of all evil. In the presence of greed, people go to extremes, and in the presence of extremes, the idea of scarcity is invented. When scarcity is invented, fear sprouts up like weeds in a garden. Every negative emotion known to man is born from fear. So this is the notorious family tree, from the roots to the branches. The extremes produced by greed beget scarcity, scarcity begets fear, and fear is the root of all destructive emotion and action. Well, I feel relieved. I would like to have a little more money. That's okay, you can have money. Money is just a certificate of exchange. Actually, people are economically healthier when they are doing a lot of exchanging. I like to see people actively exchanging goods and services. When when economies are fluid, the structures have trouble dominating. When people exchange freely, no one goes hungry, no one goes unemployed, and no worthy idea gets unproduced. Jesus Some people say that hate is the opposite of love, and recently I read a book which suggested that fear is the opposite of love. What do you say? A wry grin began to take shape on his face as he focused a quizzical look at me. I thought you would have realized by now that love has no opposites. Love is the solvent which ends all polarity. His eyes were like clear pools of water as I gazed into them and beheld the simplicity of his succinct reply. But he also knew that I still needed to dialogue on the subject, so he offered the following considerations. Fear abounds in the absence of love, and hatred is fear of love itself. Greed is an obsessive desire which attempts to nourish and supply the needs of life without love. You might say greed is an attempt to counterfeit and to subvert the power of love. This is why it is the root of all evil. And it is not limited to material possessions or money. There can be greed for attention, influence, fame, education, therapy, dependency, even misery. Anything which can establish bonds of attachment without love. So you are not wrong to consider that the absence of love brings problems. These are the greatest problems a person can have. Why greed? If you were trying to replace love utterly, 
How much would you need? I get the point. Without love, a man has lost all basis for command. The best he can hope for is control, but that requires leverage, lots of it. I have said before, the meek shall inherit the earth. But what you need to know is that this instruction has also received a poor translation. For in your language, meek implies humility and servitude. This is not what I meant. The word moderate would more accurately convey my message. Those who live in moderation will form the basis of the new earth economy and thus inherit the earth. I'm not disagreeing with you, for it sounds great in principle. But why is that greedy people seem to get ahead and moderate people are held back? That's because many people who practice moderation today are doing so only to be self-contained and to defend themselves against dreaded scarcities. The ideal reason for moderation is to share and collectively participate in a spirit of abundance. As for greed, the initial advantages of it are quite deceptive. Greed has a built-in therapy which at first generates a sense of elation. Prior to the pursuit of excess, a person might have reduced himself to a belief in scarcity and then wearied himself with countless decisions of, do I have this or do I have that? Then one day he declares, I think I'll have it all. An incredible thing has happened in that moment. He has removed his belief in scarcity and ended the duality of endless decisions. In doing so, he has released a great force of creativity within himself. Now, if he could seize the quality of that force and apply it to the connectedness of all life, he would have fulfilling prosperity instead of a destructive addiction. But too often, a person applies it to himself alone and recreates a new scarcity called only for me. Abundance applied to the self alone is a betrayal of, of the perception. I suggested that you contemplate infinity and the abundance of the universe so that you can strengthen your connections to the rest of life, not that you would process it all for yourself. There's a simple guideline which will give you unlimited potential for expansion without the perils of greed. Do not take more than you can truly love. This led to a question of ownership. Some people believe that nobody owns anything. What do you say about that? That is a very good question, he remarked. Let me put it this way. It has to do with what you are trying to own. Striving to own structure is a futile and thankless labor, for it is all transitory and illusional. This is why the creator rested on the seventh day. The effort to own and to manage structure is simply not worth it. Besides, all that your love has commanded is yours to keep anyway. If nobody ever owned anything, there would not be a command commandment against stealing. So yes, you do own, but your ownership is based upon your love and the influence it has had on the adamantine particles of your very existence. These you take with you forever. Ownership is a responsibility issue, not a title of purchase. No amount of money can give you true title to that which you have not loved. That is the law of sacred allotment. That which you have purchased with money, but for which you have no love, you will own, will own you until the time when one or more forces of the universe rip it from your hands and mercifully set you free. You own your life. You own the things that the Father has given you, the fruits of your creation, the fruits of your labor. You own the effects of all your cherished imaginings, dreams, and aspirations. You own the fruits of it all and all the memories. Wealth is the harvest of love. Remember, Love commands the adamantine particles. All that you have ever loved is what draws to you, the affairs of your life, the friends of your life, 
the family that expands your life, the dreams that extend your life. These things are yours, and this is to be honored. He cautioned, Don't try to own structure for its own sake. All structure is mortal. All structure fades away. I recommend that you store up your wealth in heaven, where the memory of your love will recreate all that is yours, leaving behind the structures which deceived you. Actually, this is the true blessing of the Sabbath, the day in which you release from your life the dominance of structure. You behold the laws of God, the infinity of the cosmos, and rest. In so doing, you have suspended the artificialities and illusions which would seek to possess you, so that you may return to the love that you are. I thought the commandment said to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. He said, go get your Bible. There's more to it than that. I had not realized before that the commandment also includes the sons, servants, cattle, and strangers in town, everyone and everything. The image which came to mind was a picture of total relaxation from all the rigidity of our lives. You cannot take a Sabbath by yourself, he pointed out. The Sabbath is a blessing you extend to everyone universally as a gift of freedom. It is a gift of amnesty from structured existence, which reveals for a moment the power and sacredness of just being. The seventh day has been greatly misinterpreted to mean that the Creator retired. Nothing could be further from the truth. The true meaning is that he creates, maintains, loves, and assists by being, not by doing, resting, not retiring. If you would be like your father, you will learn the secret of commanding life through being love. As you attain that ability, you will rise above structure. The seventh day is a celebration of your Creator's supremacy over structure. Whenever you take it unto yourself, you harmonize with that principle. Whenever you extend it to others, you are liberating the world from its prison. Why has this principle been so difficult to perceive? When structure interprets the Bible, it does so to perpetuate its illusions. When love reads the Bible, it does so to penetrate illusion and arrive at the truth. When you speak of structure, certain ideas come to mind, but my understanding may be too limited. Would you mind clarifying for me exactly what you mean by structure? Structure is an organizational factor in the universe, although a secondary and derivative one. It is love which first brings order out of chaos, but structure implements the durable patterns of orderly arrangement. Love builds your home. Structure holds the walls in place. Love builds your nation. Structure administers it. Love determines the parameters of right conduct. Structure formulates the laws which enforce it. Like the mind, Structure is good if it serves, and tyrannical if it dominates inflexibly, never submitting to the revisions of love. Structure represents the predictable, agreed-upon patterns of existence which start with simple forms and build to complex ones. It is the patterning which causes the differences of potential and holds organizational formulas in place. For example, structure is what makes the difference between steam, water, and ice, even though the ingredients are the same. But structure is not the will which determines whether H2O will become steam or ice. That is determined by harmonic adaptations to the environment, love. All structure 
is derivative summarization and is subject to revision, suspension, or development. You might say that structure is the conservational imprint which allows desirable creations to be stabilized, retained, and combined into larger aggregates of form and matter. Structure is what holds things in place. Laid upon this grid work are many mind-generated patterns and structural models used by man for control. There are no sacred designs which preceded reality. This idea has been invented to make you afraid to revise or dispense with unworkable structures and to give structures dominance over you. Occasionally, when I think about structure, I compare it to the save button on a computer, which lets us retain and integrate one formulation into another and to bring up a program again in another time and place. It's comforting to know that structure is only as important as it serves the ongoing creations of love. It's reassuring to also remember there's a delete button which restores life back to innocent potential. In society, structure is most protected by those who have attained what they want. Ironically, it is also blindly obeyed by those who have so little they fear any and all change, thinking that change will only bring more loss. This is the harmony between the rich and the poor. By contrast, those who establish and implement values based on moderation and mobility use enough structure to make life work without inhibiting growth. You experience the structures of life as blocking attachments, and they actually rob you of your true wealth. Your true wealth is on a much higher level. It is the harvest of love. You have to experience letting go in order to receive. Learn the power of letting go. This lesson is as important as loving your enemies because when you let go of structure, the real wealth that is there will multiply many times. The first thing you will learn is that you simply cannot lose your true wealth. The only thing you ever need to diminish is structure. With that realization, you will make real steps toward overcoming your enslavement by structure and move into the greater reality of brotherhood. He gave me a few practical examples which were relevant at the time. Just consider this house which you bought to renovate. By changing the deteriorating structure, you increased the value, but you are not going to put that monetary gain in the bank unless you sell the house and release it. See, that is your choice. You can keep the structure of these four walls or you can sell it and get your money. That is true of everything. Wealth is acquired as structure is released. Structure establishes order, and this is good. You build it, then in letting go, you receive your wealth. So this is what the father did on the seventh day. He said, this is good, but beingness is far better. I shall be in receivership of my true wealth, which is the harvest of love. Through twinkling eyes, he concluded his teaching that day with a gentle smile and a powerful summation. The children of God were created to harvest his true wealth, which is love. You are both his harvest and the instrument of his harvest. You are the children of his love. So the same is true for you, and this is how you build your material wealth as well. You deal with structure. You build it. You say, this is good. You sell it and make your profit to use for something else. If you never become attached to structure, the wealth will continue to build. Structure is the illusion that blocks your attainment of ultimate wealth, spiritually, intellectually, and physically. You must release the illusion to attain the truth. 
I had time that night to wonder how this principle could be applied to the crucial issue of human relationships. How would we discern between the reality of a relationship and the structure of it? What is the element in relationships which needs to be released? He must have wanted me to figure that one out for myself, because with the fullest intention of bringing it up the next morning, I would simply think upon it instead of asking. The way I see it, in any relationship, there's a lot of role playing. And sometimes we forget that role playing is not the heart of, the, of a relationship. The heart of a relationship is the reason for being together, the love that binds, and the honor that makes it worth pursuing, the truth of who you are, and the truth of the other person can be so much greater than the roles are capable of defining. Often we forget that roles are like rooms in a home that can always be redecorated, but the people who live there are the constant. Sometimes I think it may be good to let go of the role playing and just be, or maybe exchange some roles to better understand the other person's part in a relationship. That may bring in a little fresh air to expand mutual understanding, to recognize love beyond the boundaries. I do not think the harvest of love in relationships comes about by ending them. I think it happens when we release our mental preconceptions and the restrictions we've placed upon them. Perhaps only then can we have the wealth of a true relationship. At another time, he added an extra dimension to that understanding when he described the experience of death as releasing the complex structure of physical form. The soul witnesses an incredible energy release of that which was only on loan and an even more wonderful homecoming of all that has been given you by the Father. That which is commanded by your love is yours to hold forever. All who have shared your love will remain in union with you. That is your ultimate harvest. While we were on the subject of how our wealth continues, I asked him about life continuance. That was an item of particular interest to me, and so I inquired about it several times whenever it seemed appropriate. He said, Life as you know it here is too structured for you to perceive your greater continuity. All that is you continues. Life just leaves its complex form. Nothing that is you ever goes away. All of the adamantine particles that make up your body remain with you. You are remembered in the spirit forever, and the love that you are will always carry your name. As you are remembered and cherished by spirit, your recreation occurs again and again throughout eternity, whether it be in heaven, on earth, or anywhere else in your Father's infinite domain. Eventually, I had the courage to use the word reincarnation. What do you have to say about the subject of past and future lives? His reply was to the point. Your immortality is a simple thing, and so your understanding will be more accurate if you keep it simple as well. By the will of God, life creates a place for you infinitely again and again, according to your love and in relation to your loved ones. He cautioned, the philosophy of reincarnation is not that simple. It does affirm your continuity and that is good. However, there's a twist in it which defers your immortality back to structure and linearity, which is not true. Your immortality is not imprisoned within a wheel of life or pathway of cause and effect. Neither are you the product of linear evolvement. You were created in perfection and perfect love and you do continue to re-manifest infinitely, but it is according to the will of the Father and according to your own purposes, your own love, and your own place of service and learning. 
he added with a touch of humor. You actually have only one life. It's just a very long one with many chapters. I laughed and all seriousness disappeared. As I digested that infusion of understanding, I saw how some people are searching for cause and effect reasons to explain their lives. So they extend their search even into ancient history, looking for an origination point. The origination point is love, God's, theirs, and others. There is cause and effect in the way matter, energy, time, and space integrate and combine to become physical substance, in addition to the structures which conserve and limit those creations. Nevertheless, love is the real source and is the commander of even structure, not the result of it. For the first time in my life, I saw that love is a cause, not a creation. I was pleased with my realization, and he watched serenely while I painted. Before the day was over, he spoke again. All too often, people who look to the subject of reincarnation for answers are actually trying to find themselves. That is a misdirection. There is no other time or place to find yourself. Now is your only context. The past is gone. Only the ego would cling to an identity out of context. You will rarely find anyone talking about a past life as a pauper, a leper, or a thief. Typically, one boasts about lives lived as a king, a hero, or a saint. That is the ego taking out of turn, trying to enslave the soul in its structure. Your immortality has no need of structure. The source of your identity does not lie in any kind of linear path. The source of your identity lies only in your love. He looked at me and asked, Who are you? Love, I confidently replied. In truly knowing that, you do not need to know anything else about yourself. That will bring the other answers you seek. It will bring to you an assurance of your immortality and faith in the immortal love which you share with others. As you become strengthened in that understanding, it will also bring into focus your own true purpose, for your purpose is rooted in love. There are many therapies having to do with hypnotic regressions into past lives. Do they work, and are they of any value? It all depends on the honesty of those facilitating and receiving the remembrance. As to the value, that lies entirely in letting go, in releasing that which is no longer useful. Sincere and thorough forgiveness will accomplish the same thing. Is there anything forgotten in our collective past that we need to know about, I asked? There is the original birth trauma, which most people are still working through. There was a time before which you were, but there will never be a time after which you are not. There was a time when you were one and complete within the source of love. Love, however, decided to give you immortality as yourself and to grant you an identity of your own. It was a great and glorious gift that you were given, full of promise, opportunity, and responsibility. But the children of God having no point of reference other than the simplicity of a common light, experienced it as shock and interpreted the gift of life as separation. Many deeply wounded themselves by viewing it as a rejection. That was a tragic misconception, and many of the problems and pains that have been suffered by humanity are the result of this birth trauma some people can relate to this directly because the trauma of physical birth also has left them with emotional scars of rejection and isolation after years of dysfunctional relationships a recognition of the problem and correct therapy has often proven to be healing 
how much more significant it will be when the soul recognizes its duress and awakens to its magnificent endowment. What is preventing the realization? People are torn between wanting to go home and fearing the loss of personal freedom, wanting to stay apart and fearing the perils of becoming lost. It must be realized that even though you are one with the Father, you will never be resorbed into collective anonymity. Each person is honored by having his own place within the one spirit, and there will never be a time after which you are not. You have been given eternal life in your own name when you are able to comprehend the grandeur of that gift you will be able to experience your birth anew with ecstasy. You viewed it as separation the first time and have dramatized and structured it as separation ever since. Herein is man's dependency upon structure and obsession with it, for structure has become a substitute source of security. The great healing that is soon to take place on earth will lift mankind above the trauma of his original birth, revealing the truth of his being and establishing his place of honor within the wondrous universe. Mm. 